In this video, we look at special types of curves known as geodesics. Simply put, a geodesic is the path between two points in space that minimizes the distance traveled along this path. If you're talking about a Euclidean space, such a path would be a straight line. But what if the space is non-Euclidean, such as a curved surface? In a previous video, link in the description, we saw that the square length of a line segment is given by this formula, where gij is the metric tensor and dxi the infinitesimal change along the coordinate i. The distance s along an arbitrary path between two points is simply the sum over the infinitesimal distances vs along the path. Every path we choose will give us a specific s. We could say that s is a function of the path. Clearly, some paths give larger s than others, and one of the paths, the geodesic, will give the smallest. So how do we go about finding it? The task is very similar to calculus of one variable. Recall that if x0 is where a function, say f of x, reaches either a peak or the bottom of a valley, called x -trimum, then f expanded around this point is a parabola. In other words, f prime of x0 equals to zero. We can extend this approach to our distance s. Let us imagine that we know the path that minimizes s. Let's call this path y. We can choose an arbitrary parameter, say lambda, to help us describe this path, such that at some initial lambda, lambda 1, we begin the journey at the point x1, and at some final lambda, lambda 2, we end up at the point x2. Let's pick an arbitrary but finite curve chi, such that chi at x1 and x2 is 0, and multiply by a parameter epsilon. If epsilon is infinitesimal, then y plus epsilon chi is a curve that is infinitesimally close to y. The distance along this curve is s, evaluated at y plus epsilon chi. Notice that s is now a function of only one parameter, epsilon. If epsilon is zero, the distance is an extremum. We can now expand s in powers of epsilon. To simplify our notation, we let x dot be the derivative of x with respect to lambda. The distance along an arbitrary curve, x, can then be expressed as an integral of a lambda. The distance along the red curve is given by this integral. A Taylor expansion up to the first order on epsilon gives us the following expression, where eta is short for this. If y is the curve that minimizes s, then this entire expression must be zero. Here's the same expression again. Notice that the first term in the brackets contains chi, while the other two terms contain chi dot. We can apply partial integration to the last two terms in order to convert chi dot into chi. But first, let's make our lives a little easier. I said at the beginning that lambda can be any parameter at all, and it is still true. However, if we choose lambda to be the distance traveled along the path, eta becomes 1. To see this, simply plug in the expression for ds in terms of the metric in the components of x dot of an arbitrary curve x. ds appears on both sides so we can cancel it out. What's left is this, but this is just the inverse of eta. So eta must be 1. Now that we got that out of the way, we can do the integration by parts. The first term can be written as follows. Just carry out the chain rule to convince yourself that this is true. Integration of the first term gives zero for the simple reason that chi is zero at the two ends of the curve. What's left then is this. Repeating the same procedure for the second term yields this expression. Inserting these back into the original integral, we end up with chi multiplying every term. Notice that all indices here are summed over and therefore we can relabel them any way we want. Let's relabel them as follows. This allows us to factor out chi. Remember that in order for y to be a geodesic, this integral must be zero. But given that chi is arbitrary, this is possible only if the expression in the brackets is zero for all components. Recognizing these identities, we can cast this condition into a nicer form. Multiplying both sides by the inverse metric 
GQK inverse, and summing over K, liberates the second derivative term on the left hand side. And we end up with this equation. We recognize this part as the Christoffel symbol and may write the equation in a more compact form. We can simplify it further by defining a new function u as the derivative of x with respect to s. Finally, we end up with a first order nonlinear differential equation for every component q. This is called the geodesic equation. The vector u is a unit vector tangent to the geodesic. How can we prove this? Well, we've already seen that this identity is true. Hence, the vector u has a unit length. Recall the infinitesimal distance vector ds, which is equivalent to this, and also this. Since the length ds is just a scaling factor, u must be pointing in the same direction as ds. Hence, it is tangent to the geodesic. And that concludes this video. Enjoy the ride through the galaxy.